Acts 6, and then we're also going to read a couple of verses from Hebrews 4. And uh, I really just want to just take a little snippet, ask a question. We read it come across a character here. His name is Stephen. And, uh, and uh, it says there's something quite unique about his life. And then we simply ask the question, why, why is this man, what would Stephen's emphasis be today if he was living today? What would his emphasis be in today's generation? Verse 1 of Acts 6. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now notice that about these, these elders or these, uh, these men of God at that particular time, these twelve uh, men, these men said, look, the purpose that God has called us to is to the word and the prayer. That was one of their main focus. Wherefore, brethren, verse 3, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Uh, and, the, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timion, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then we're going to turn over to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, and we're just going to read together just two verses, and then we're going to pray together. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse verse 12. And this is what the Word of God says. Verse 12 of Hebrews 4, For the Word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joint and the marrow, and as the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, we, neither is there any creature that is, that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And we'll end our reading there, and we know that God will bless his word. This is just in passing. It's amazing as you read through Scripture, sometimes the word of God touches in places that we don't like, but that's exactly what God does do, because he touches the areas in our lives that, that cannot be seen by human eyes. The physical eye can't see areas in our hearts that are corrupt and deceitful, as Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperate wicked, and who can know it? But him who, who is the judge of all men, he is the one of the Scripture says that there's nothing hidden from him. All things are naked in his sight. No matter what type of covering you might put over it, he sees right into the innermost recesses of our hearts. And that's why even for us as God's people, how dare any of us dare to come proudly before his throne or arrogantly thinking that we are of any type good or self-righteous in ourselves. The Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. He sees our hearts today. And we come humbly and we say, Lord, how desperate we need your cleansing and your filling that we might walk worthy of your calling. Let's bow for prayer just before we share a few thoughts this morning around God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we pray not just will you bless the word of God that has been preached over this past week at the tent, but in anticipation as we move forward into a new week that your word will be anointed and, and Lord, a great power will be given to your servant George as he endeavors to open up simply the truths of your word and, and light will be poured in upon the hearts of those who are in darkness. Now, Lord, today we come very consciously aware that we need your help. And will it be, Lord, as we stand behind a pulpit or sit in front of a pulpit, that we need unction that comes only from heaven. And it's not something that's man-made or man-generated. Lord, we want that which we know is, as it were, is God's smile upon us. Whenever we know that, that uh, liberating power in the Spirit to proclaim your word. We don't want it, Father, that men might speak well of us. 
We want it that men might speak well of thee. We want people to turn their attention to you today. And we ask that, Lord, you would grant it for your name's sake. So, Lord, help us now. We look to ask you just for fresh cleansing in the blood. And we ask you, Lord, for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit to enable us for this task before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you know that Stephen was one of these men that were called for, for a specific task of ministry, of serving at the tables. But there's a number of things that characterizes the life of Stephen, this man of God. And not only does the Word of God tell us in, in the book of Acts, not just does it tell us very clearly that this man was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, uh, but the Bible also says very, we also realize that this man, we know very clearly from Scripture, he was very faithful in the ministry that God had called him to. And that's why these men looked to him, because he was faithful in the job he was already doing. And so uh, one preacher, one commentator says, John Phillips says, that the early church was expanded rapidly. Thousands were being converted and also being added to the church. Extraordinary things were happening, and, and the early church needed to appoint deacons for a specific task of ministry, a specific task and job. And this is where really where Stephen fits in. He was one of these men who was of sterling character. He was one of these men whose his integrity was, was, be with, was with beyond all question. And also he was a man who was filled with the Holy Ghost. But he was faithful in the job that he already had. And that's why these men, whenever they looked for someone to do this role, they saw he was already being faithful in the task task that he was already minister involved in doing before they gave him this role as a deacon. And dearly, folks, I would say that for as we move forward in the work of God, and dearly, whenever you, well, it be as you, uh, whether for the past you already have or for in the future, maybe in some way of years gone down the road, when you look for men to do, take up roles within a job, one of the things that we look for, one of the marks is for faithfulness. It's not about successfulness, it's about faithfulness. It's about those knowing when we stand before God on that great white day, whenever the Lord says, well done, now good and successful servant. That's what he's looking for now. Somebody who, is, who has possibly led hundreds of souls of the Lord and someone who's been through many trials and difficulties, always come out on top. Not at all. He says, he, he says those words when we stand before him, he says, well done, now, thou good and faithful servant, enter the end of the joy of thy rest. And so uh, Stephen was one of these men who, who was classed as being a, a faithful minister. And so the challenge comes to our lives, even just as we outline, as we begin, our, as a wee bit of an introduction, how, how faithful am I in the roles that God has called me to? Will it be as a Sunday school teacher? Will it be as a church member? How faithful am I in my attendance to the work of God? Uh, how faithful am I in, in the roles that God has placed upon my shoulder, the burdens to carry? How faithful am I in this ministry? Not only was he a faithful minister, but he was also someone who was a fearless messenger. And I would say, good people, if a man, a man of God is going to stand behind a pulpit, these marks have got to be about his life. I mean, he's got to be a faithful messenger because he's got to be faithful to what God's Word says. Now, it might not always mean people might not like him. In fact, people might loathe him. Some people might even despise him. But the reality of the day, folks, a man, a man who stands to preach God's word is not, if he's there merely for man's approval, then undoubtedly he's in a sort of a downward slope. And that slope now, there's no brakes on it. It's irrelevant what you make, you make not, you make, I'm not saying you don't agree with your pastor, he's sitting looking at me now and he's a brave stern face on him, I'm very in case of why I wonder what I'm going to say about him. You may not like certain things about Pastor George McConnell. But one thing you will never question is his faithfulness to God's Word. And one of the blessings that God has blessed you with this man of God is that he's endeavoring to be faithful to what God has given to him. Also, a man of God must not be fear. He must be a fearless messenger, not worrying what people think of him. What people, what people say, Stephen was such a character. He was... He was not just a server of the table, but he was also someone who proclaimed the word. In fact, if you were reading Acts chapter 6, 9 to 10, it says very definitely there that whenever this man proclaimed the word, whenever he preached the word boldly, uh, he preached the word boldly and he lived what he preached. And it is said that on that particular occasion, the people looked at him and their faces were filled with fury and rage because the, that, that as he preached in Acts 7, we're told that, that the Word of God cut right into their hearts and they didn't like what they had to hear. 
They didn't like what he was proclaiming because it was hitting them just where they needed it. And so often, folks, whenever we endeavor, the, for men of God, as we endeavor to move forward, and as they endeavor to move forward in the things of God, yes, they must be faithful, but they must be fearless. But the th third thing you notice about this man, Stephen, yes, he was faithful in his ministry. He was fearless in his ministry. Even though as he preached the word, there were people who looked at him with anger and fury. But the Bible also says he was the first martyr. So he was this first man who was going to die for the faith. The stand that he was going to take was going to cost him his own life. And I don't know, folks, we live in a generation today, and uh, I'm not saying today that it's going to cost us our lives. It may cost us some of our livelihood. I remember standing with a, gospel, a man from God, We Gospel Hall, my wife went to New York, and he said, you know, to be a Christian is one of the most expensive ways of life because you have to be very honest. He says sometimes it's very costly. And, uh, and sometimes, and, and dearly in the Christian life, it's going to cost us because the Bible says we've got to be willing to lay down our own lives. He said, if any man come after me, let us lay down his own life. Jesus, Jesus said in John 12, it was of W.P. Nicholson's testimony. He said, except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth, uh, uh, and except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if a day, it bringeth forth much fruit. There's this sense whereby, uh, there's this sense whereby there must be a day unto self and a day unto the old man and a day unto the old nature. But here was this man, he was dying, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a day into self, but it was a day of, uh, he was going to physically die because he was going to be stoned to death. Uh, but he endeavored to keep focused on the job. But I asked the question, Stephen, if Stephen were to be, in, be with us this morning, if it's possible with us, Stephen, what emphasis, what is your emphasis upon the Christian life? Well, it be for a young person who's just, somebody who's recently convert, got converted or someone who's been on the road for a long time, what is it that is so important that you would place emphasis upon in your, in, on the Christian journey was the most important thing. Now, here was this man, he was full of the, he was full of the Spirit. The Bible said he was full of the Holy Ghost. And he was full of faith. So I lived in Plymouth. My wife and I lived in Plymouth for a while. And there was a while there, while we were there, there was this thought that went round, well, a true mark of a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit is that he can talk in tongues. That's the mark. If he's, if he's full of the Spirit, he can talk in another language. You don't understand the language, but you can talk in the language anyway. And I read this book, and I, I don't necessarily see, the, I don't necessarily see that, that that's the case at all. Some people say, well, if, if, you're, if you're full of the Holy Ghost, you'll be able to go about doing healings and wonders and miracles. Well, I want to say to you folks, if a man like Stephen were to be here this morning, I were to say to him, what would you say is the most important thing in your Christian journey? I am convinced that Stephen would say to you, the most important thing is this book. Because the Word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharp than any two-edged sword. It's this book that we need to be our emphasis upon. Not upon other things, but upon this book. You say, uh, what, what is special about this book? Well, I'll give you three simple little thoughts. Number one, you should love it. Number one, number two, you, you ought to learn it. And number three, you ought to lean upon it. You love it, why? Because the Scripture says that and whenever Paul wrote to young Timothy, that from a child there is known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. We love it because this book reveals truth to us. We learn it. Because the, the psalmist says, In thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We lean upon it. Why? Because the uh, book of Proverbs says, trust, trust the Lord with all thy heart and lean not in thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Back in the year 1815, there was a little group that started up in the southwest of England, a little church called the Bible Believing Christians. They came together. And, uh, and ultimately, they, they called themselves the Bible Christian Movement. In fact, if you go to St. Ives Day, you will find a wee Bible Christian chapel that's there today in St. Ives. And they're a good group of wee people. I've spoke for them a number of times. And the reason why they called themselves the Bible Christian, the wee Bible Christian chapel was because they, they believed that the, the most important thing in the life of any believer or in the life of any fellowship was the Bible. Nothing takes priority over that. Because the Bible is God's word to us, God speaking to us. And so I consider this thought about the Scriptures and why the Scriptures are so important and the believer and so important to Timothy. And these thoughts came to my mind. I just want to leave them with you very simply. Why is the Word of God important for us? 
because the Word of God, first and foremost, folks, it searches our hearts. Now, you can talk to people and you can very easily deceive people. Like, you can deceive your pastor, maybe not intentionally, but you can deceive your pastor away because he can only see the exterior. But folks, you see this book now. This book goes to the recesses of our hearts. This book searches parts of our lives that nobody else can see or know anything about. You can be one thing today and something else tomorrow, and nobody else might know another thing about it except you and God. Because nothing is hidden from Him. His Word searches our hearts. His Word reveals Himself to us. It reveals our sin to us. It reveals our shortcomings to us. It reveals our iniquities to us. It reveals our transgressions to us. Scripture says very simply, Thy word is truth. Uh, Psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Purpose of His word, uh, for His word coming to us, even whenever we were in an unsaved condition, is to re reveal our exceeding sinfulness of our sin, but also is to reveal the magnificence of our Savior. Because here's this one who came, who died in our place, who bore our sin in his own body on the tree. We who were condemned, we who were dead in our trespasses and our sins, this one, he has come and he has revealed himself to us. Because his word has searched me. His word has put, his light, his light has been turned on in my soul and it's been showing me things that I know is wrong. You know, folks, even this morning as we sit in the house of God, you know, even as Christians, his word reveals to me pride. His word reveals to me selfishness. His word, the spirit, reveals to me a critical spirit. These things that whenever we look into our lives as God's people and we see things that we don't like. And then we come to that beautiful text of Scripture in 1, in 1 John when the, when the Apostle John writes that beautiful word, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then he goes on to write, he says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. He says, we don't want you to keep on sinning. And then he says these words for those who battle. And undoubtedly, folks, let's be honest. For some of us, if you've been honest as a Christian, there is this constant battle going on in our lives. And just like the Apostle Paul said, the good that I would do, that I do not. And the things I don't want to do, those things I end up doing. Who can deliver me from this body of the flesh? And then he says these words. He says, my little chin, he's saying right on you, is not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not just for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. Folks, thank God this morning for a Father who is merciful and gracious when we least deserve it. His word searches our hearts. His word reveals truth to us. What has his word been revealing to you? Let me say to you secondly, not just does his word reveal truth, not just does it search our hearts, but his word is our source of life. Because that we were born our trespassing our sins, we were born dead, spiritually dead. And we need life. It's what's called the new birth. It's what's called in John chapter 3, when Jesus said, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's why we need this new life now, because we are dead. And there's no hope, folks. There's no hope of us reviving ourselves. There's no hope of us bringing life to this old man, this old nature, this old sin nature. There's only one way this old man is going, and it's on a downward slope, and it's on a broad road, and it leads to destruction. And the only way this can, there can be a turnabout in our lives is because of a man called Christ Jesus and repentance. Yet the hymn writer says, it's not thy tears of repentance or prayers, but the blood that atones for the soul. And him then believe and a pardon receive for his blood, can I make thee quite whole? It's our source of life. Listen to what Peter says. 
being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, for all flesh is as grass, and all glory of, uh, of man as the flower of grass, the gra grass withereth, and the flower there falleth away, but the word of God shall endure forever. Uh, folks, I need this new life, because without this new life, which is in Christ, I'll never see heaven. Without this new life in Christ, hell is my destiny. Without this new life in Christ, I'll be separated from God for all of eternity. That's why I need this new life. Tell me this morning, have you got this new life? And I'm not asking you, have you got church? I'm not asking you, have you got religion? I'm not asking you how you remember and... and Kilkeel Tabernacle, Baptist Tabernacle. I'm asking you these things. I'm asking you this morning, have you got this new life which is in Christ Jesus? Because if you haven't, your end will be destruction. Your end will be separation. But your end ultimately will be utter darkness. And yet Jesus has come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. His word searches our hearts. His word is our source of life. Let me say to you thirdly, his word is our sustenance to life. It's our sustenance to life. Listen to what Peter says, 1 Peter 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. So whenever I come to this place of saving faith in Christ Jesus, and I ask him to be my Savior, and I ask him to, to cleanse this heart of mine from sin, then the reality is that I'm now beginning a new journey. And that journey is a journey of growing. A journey is a grow journey of knowing. Because not just am I growing in grace, but I'm beginning to know God better. Now, he doesn't need to know me any better because... He knew me yet whenever I was still in my mother's womb. He knows all about me. And I had to honestly say to you good people this morning, why God be bothered with me, I do not know. The only thing I can put it down to is mercy and grace is why God is bothered with somebody like me. But he wants me to grow and he wants me to know. He wants me to grow in Christ, but he wants me to get to know God better. So whenever a little child is born into the world, like for example, whenever our Lucy, the little girl there, our dog, whenever she had her first litter of pups, everything was grand, no bother. Man, she fed them, she looked after them, she cared them for three weeks, they didn't have to do a top. Not a thing they have to do till whenever they got weaned and all the rest. And then I was running after them four times a day. And, and oh, the wife, she was happy. She was going out to work and I was happy. She was happy. All right, of course, and we're going to, well, maybe she did it early morning. Then I was out again at 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock and back out in the evening, feeding them and looking after them and caring for them and all the rest. But the thing that concerned me is whenever she had her second letter, when there was a wee one was born, and it seemed that the old mother knew from the very beginning that she wasn't, he wasn't going to make it. I called him Dainty Dan. We small fella. Man, he was like, some may call him the runt of the litter. He wasn't the last one that was born. It's quite early on. But boys, it seemed to be that she just knew that he wasn't going to make it. She made no attempts to try even and, and bring him close to her. Uh, it seemed to be all the other pups, whenever they were just born, they all made, even though their wee eyes were closed, they all made their way to water. Somehow, some way, they made their way to water. Why? I'll tell you why. Because even though these little pups are just born now, these little pups know that they need something to, to, to sustain them, that they may grow. They need milk. They need food. Now, folks, whenever you get this new life, what happens is God gives you new desires, new interests, new, new appetites. Remember a fellow called Gary Tutte shared his testimony time in Edinburgh, and he said, the things that I used to love, I now hate, and the things I used to hate, I now love. God gives us this desire. So a little child is born into the house. And things seem to be going well till one day it starts rejecting milk and rejecting food. Might miss his first one meal. Might turn down the second. But I guarantee you by the time the third one comes along, mother's getting anxious. Father's getting fretful. Beyond the phone, maybe ringing the mother or the mother-in-law and saying, look, there's something wrong here. We Jimmy, we Sally... 
you know, they're not feeding. And you're instantly, you're, the, the mother is this instinct, she's concerned, she's greatly concerned for the little one because she knows if he doesn't feed, he doesn't live. If he doesn't feed, he doesn't grow. Folks, within the family of God, there ought to be a care for one another. Because people, sadly, we can very easily grow cold. We can very easily get lukewarm. We can very easily let what people say to us for some unknown reason, because of what they say, hinder us from looking to God. And we, what happens is, when we take our attention of God and look to men, then we get not only do we get disappointed, but we get deeply hurt. And then what happens? I'll tell you what happens. We stop spending time in this book. We stop taking time to listen for his voice. My sheep, John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck me out of my hand. He says, what, what's going on here? These people, they're no longer able to be sustained because they're no, will, not lo, no longer willing to spend time in my presence. Tell me this morning, there's a wee hymn. I don't know the words of it very well, nor I'm never even going to attempt to sing it, but I'm going to say them to you, and I'll not get all the verse out because I don't know it all, but this is what it says. And I have to honestly say, every time I repeat these words, these words are like an arrow to my own soul. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord? I, let me, folks, let me just trap away all these old trappings here in case you think there's any sort of uh, uh, stuff here. Uh, let me say this to you. You can go through motions. You can say the words. You can carry out the life. But you know and I know that the heart can have grown cold. And what Paul's saying here, or what Stephen, you say, Stephen, what is important? The importance is you, you need to, we need to be sustained. This is what Paul said to the church at Corinth. He says, and I would, uh, uh, says Paul, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but unto carnal. Now, these were to his brothers and sisters in the Lord. He said, I'd love to say you were spiritual, but you're not spiritual. He says, you're carnal. Even though now, now, get this now. These are his brothers in the faith. He's not trying to be hard with them. He's just trying to be honest with them. He's trying to say, God is using his words to use something that will hit them between the eyes. Like the other day, I was moving electric fencer. Any of you boys farmers here, are you? Any of you boys? Put up your hand if you're a farmer. Oh, don't be ashamed of yourselves. Get your hands out of your pockets. Your money will stay in there. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not to follow that course. I used a well-packed back. But anyway, uh, the boy asked me, move, I was up helping a friend all day, moving electric fence. He said, move that fence. He said, no bother. Thought of the wee boy, we, now you, you townies will have no clue what this is, but don't worry about it. Uh, it was this wee switch, uh, on and off switch, and I thought I'd switched her off, but I hadn't. And I left, pulled the wrong end. Boys, it's, uh, you know it's like? It gets a thump on your elbow. Boys, it's way loud thump. It's way, and I nearly felt like kicking it, but I was trying to be sanctified and trying to hold my, hold my temper. But anyway, and it just hit me. You know what I'm going to say to you, folks? Sometimes God just uses the word just to hit us in the very point that we need it. And that's what Paul was saying here to this church at Corinth. He says, listen, men. Listen, people. I don't speak to you as spiritual, but I'm the carnal. Who, us? He says, I would have fed you with milk. I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able for you are yet carnal, for whereas there are among you there are strife and divisions, and are you not carnal and walk as men? So internally, these men were, and externally, these men were carrying on like, like ungodly people. And Paul just had to just give them that shock treatment. Say, look, listen, man, that's the moment. Ways up and grow up. 
so we need to be sustained. I need to be sustained. I'll tell you what happens to me. We get dry. I'll tell you what happens. We lose the joy. We go through the motions. Things start lacking. Like we maybe miss one midweek and then we miss another one. Before no one, ugh, you know, just too busy. Listen, look, there's the clocks and all stuff. Let me say very quickly to you. Stephen, what other point, before we finish, what other point may I say, yes, has your word, you're telling us the word searches our hearts, and yes, you're telling us your word, the word of God is our source of life, and yes, you're telling us the word of God sustains us in life. But what else, what else do you want to say about the word? One last thing, says Steve, one last thing. His word is our strength in life. It's our strength. See, when Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, he told them about a, a spiritual battle, a conflict. He says, now, one modern-day commentator says, whenever you join God's army, you no longer play in the playground, but you know, are in a battlefield. And that is true, folks. There's this transition whereby we ain't on the playground anymore, but the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers. You say, well, how can I stand against the enemy? Well, you can't. I can't. I can't. How can you stand against the enemy? Here's one who, who, whenever he is cast from heaven, he takes a third of the angels with him with the wheel of, wheel of his tail. His strength far exceeds my strength. But his strength does not far exceed God's strength. Because the Bible says, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. See, have you ever been tempted? Shepherds have. Jesus was tempted. So it tells you that temptation is not sin. Remember the wee chorus, man, we're learning in Gospel Hall. Yield not the temptation, for yielding a sin. Each, each victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions of Jew. Look ever to Jesus, and he will carry you through. If only that was true, folks. If each victory that you won was better, it help you for the next one. But Jeepers, you can get victory today and be lost, defeated tomorrow. Every day I need his strength. Whenever Jesus was tempted, was led in the wilderness and was tempted by the devil, Matthew 4, you know what it was, by the, led by the spirit of the wilderness, he was tempted. And on those three occasions, folks, you know what I'm going to say, those three occasions, every time the enemy came to him, every time, what did Jesus use? Love it, learn it, and lean upon it. The Word. Every time, turn these bread and stones under bread. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Fall down and worship me. Thou shalt not worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Good folks, can I say to you, how am I going to become strong? Pastor was speaking about these children one day becoming men and women of God. When do we move from, you know, as children, go, as you watch children, they go from immaturity and then they move into maturity. I had a dear pastor, uh, a godly man, Dr. Dennis Alby. He was a, over in England whenever we were there, and he was a, one of the finest preachers I've ever heard in my life. He was a storyteller. And uh, I really, to honestly, maybe, you know, you should never covet, but sometimes you sort of wish you had a little bit of his talent or a little bit of his gift, but he was never an arrogant man. But he said, I remember the day my son came of age. You, we don't really hear of people coming of age now. You know, it used to be whenever you turned 18, you get a key of the house. Cheapers they get a key of the house now whenever they're eight. There you go, just tear away, make yourself home. Like, like, uh, you know, uh, Anyway, setting that all aside, he says, I remember the day my son came of age. What did he mean by that? He, be, he moved from immaturity to maturity. He says, you know when it was? He says, the day we went to a restaurant. We're all sitting around. He said, a restaurant? What are you doing a restaurant? He said, we're having a feed. And he says, we're sitting around the table. And he says, the bill came. Well, he says, Daddy always paid the bill to this day. He says, Daddy, keep your hand in your pocket. It's on me. And he says, that day I realized my son came of age. 
he was no longer looking to me to pay the bill. I work for it now. Now, Daddy, let me pay for it. Folks, can I say something to you? The problem, and I ain't, like, don't, don't, please don't take this wrong. My, sometimes my experience, sadly in Christian work, has been babies and cuts. And when they don't get their way, there's a wee thing called a dummy, and they throw it out, and there's an uproar. You know what it's called? It's called immaturity. It's not just found in babies. It can be found in 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, and even in 60-year-olds. Why? Because they've never come of age. What are you leaning upon today? Are you his this morning? As you've been coming to the services, as you've sat here in the, under your pastor's ministry, do you know he couldn't know them things about you that he speaks of? How does he know this about me? Because this is the Spirit of God working, searching your heart, revealing truth. Showing you salvation is in no other way except through Jesus. And you need him this morning. You need him right now. And then those of us who are his, oh, how his word searches us. Sustains us. Thank God is able to strengthen us. I know how we need his strength. For some of we're very weak. And Lord, I need your help. That I might live for you. Let's pray together. Father, as we draw this service to a close, we would pray earnestly that by your spirit that you'll do your work. Glorify your name. And Lord, let your word touch all of our hearts today. Whether we're standing behind the pulpit or sitting in front of it. Gracious God, don't let it just go in one ear and out the other. But give us that shock treatment if we need it. To waken up and see where we're at. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to just sing a couple of verses of a lovely hymn.